Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Nirmal Banga. I'm here, Aldadia. We have with us uh, Dr. Dinesh Duar, CEO and whole time director at MS Nectar Life Sciences, chairman at Pharmaxel, Ministry of Commerce, Government of India, and chairman at CII North Committee on Life Sciences, as well as and past chairman at CII North Committee on Startups and Entrepreneurship. A lot of things, uh, Dinesh, that you know you actually have been working closely with right now. If you have to look at the condition of the economies across the world, a very generic question I'm going to take is, what is the sense that you pick up right now on the back of COVID, on the kind of impact that it could have? Uh, thank you, Hill, for getting me on your channel. It's such a pleasure. Thank you. You could have asked a better question here because every, each one of us is concerned about the economy. And what's been happening is that, look, each one of us are passing through a very, very uh, fact of the matter, difficult and stressed times. Whoever you speak to, whatever it is, mm -hmm. you're passing through very difficult times. There is, as it is, there was already uh, a sense that economy was going down, right, pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. Our own country, when we were trailblazing at about seven, eight, nine percent in the yesteryears, we came down to about 5% thereabouts, and uh, not to speak of the Western countries, they were in the zone of 1%, 2% or even declines. So COVID has accentuated the downslide and decline in a very rapid manner. I mean, you look at the numbers of the United States, their, their unemployment levels are unparalleled for the last one century and thereabouts. And the same is the case with Western Europe. Japan shrunk their economy by close to about 2% as, as of this morning. So overall, there is a complete downturn in economy uh, and with a prelude pre-COVID of uh, an economic downturn globally, with no exception, including China, right? Uh, the, the roller coaster continues to be where it is. Now look at India. Projections mm -hmm. uh, in the next quarter could be as low as minus two to minus 4% of their amounts and projections by the best of best consultants and advisors or economic gurus all over the world for India is about minus 4%. Now that's, that's unthinkable for a country which has been growing at such rapid rate. And all of this started here, if you recall, uh, from China. China COVID infestation actually started in November, got surfaced uh, sometime in December and got massively resurfaced in January. So this downslide uh, on, on, for a country like China, which has been growing uh, along with India at such massive rates, had started way back in November. And the net result of that, you're, you're now seeing in China as well, besides all, of the, all the other economies. Right. So overall, that's a broad impact that we're looking at. To break it down further, let's look at the pharma sector as a whole. Now, if you talk about pharma, the Indian pharma industry has been a world leader, especially if you talk from the generic side of it, both globally and in domestic markets because the contribution is significantly good in terms of volumes. Now, if you have to look at the impact on the pharma sector as a whole, what are the places where we've seen a negative impact and where do you see that we have opportunities lying from here on? Uh, look, uh, pharma is a very different story. COVID or no COVID, pharma doesn't stop. It's Correct. The disruptions which were created post lockdown 25th of March. Uh, let me give you a backdrop about mm. India. You know, when I passed out of uh, Indian Institute of Management in Ahmedabad way back in '79, I stepped into a company called Hext or Hext. Or, you, if you go to Narman Point, there's an iconic building. Mm -hmm. that's, right? that's where I started my career along with two other classmates. Mine, my mm. job, and I'm very fond of saying that it's a nostalgic memory. You know, my, and they were the biggest, largest pharmaceutical company in the world, along with BASF and Bayer of Germany, you know, these three German chemical joints and pharmaceutical joints, number one, two, and three competing over the last one decade from there on. Mm. My job there as a starry eyed, blue eyed, I am eyed was to, there were no computers, no nothing at that point in time. My job was to sit down, calculate how much profit can be retained in Germany. Mm -hmm. but everything was important. I mean, we were net importers to about 70, 80% both in combinations and API. Mm. API used to be imported from the parent company into your factory in Bulun, and that's where you use uh, to solve the jigsaw of the costing so that you minimize your taxation in India 
and keep back your profits as much as you can because you have a lot of leeway with the German government. And from then on, 41 years down the line, here will be very mighty pleased to know that we are the pharmacy to the world. We supply our formulations to 206, 206 countries, or 211 countries. And mm -hmm. those countries that we don't directly supply to are actually getting indirect supplies through Paris and Francophone countries, right? And that's a huge transition. Volume-wise, here we are the third largest in the mm -hmm. world. Value-wise, we are ninth largest in the world. We are a pharmacy to the world on the formulation side. A lot has happened from the time the Uruguay, uh, you know, trade talks happened, and uh, the then prime minister walked out of the meeting, saying that look, we're going to be self-sufficient. She, along with some wonderful bureaucrats, gave a clarion call to the Indian pharmaceutical entrepreneurs. And lo and behold, the chemistry of India came out to the fore. And, and the academia collaborated massively at that point in time when nobody had heard of uh, industry academia collaboration. They worked over time to make sure that their chemistry skills come out. We were very fortunate mm -hmm. that TRIPS favored us uh, until about 31st of December 1998, which is 1st of January 1999. So we had this benefit of working through process patents. We could, you know, I still remember those heady days when our professors and our r and heads would come and say, hey guys, I've got two more cost-effective processes where the product patent is not a deterrent for you guys. So if you had, you know, if you had an intellectual property right as of 31st December 1998, you would not recognize the product patent. You will go through the process patent. Same molecule at one tenth the cost could be produced in India very efficiently. And that's where the progression started. And India really moved massively towards the 90s to, to control and dominate the world. The, the generic uh, jigsaw puzzle got sold predominantly in the mid 80s to the 90s. And that's where today, very proud to tell you, have the largest number of US FDA, including US, mm -hmm. taking US. Very, very, City, right? We have the largest number of A and D everywhere in new drug application. Okay. It's like a passport to enter the United States market. Mm -hmm. And file both ways. Both. We have the largest number of drug master files for the APIs in the world, in the United States and Europe. Right? What else do you need after this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We might be talking about API very shortly. Yeah. So, so pretty. Correct. But on the API front as well, in the domestic market, a vulnerability to the extent of almost is 90% on China. Now, how do we handle this national insecurity? You know, let me differentiate this for you. Hmm. So you have to look at the API consumption hmm. as a back end for the domestic market, which is currently valued at about $22 billion, right? About 10%. It's slightly slowed down in the post-COVID era. Right? Hmm up as we go along, right? And because of supply chain disruptions, exports are also $22 billion, but they were growing at 12% until Jan and Feb and March slowed it down, and March in particular slowed it down. There was a negative 23% decline, degrowth, because of disruptions. Hmm. Uh, in exports, we grow by 8%, 7.97%. Okay, okay. Right? In domestic, I completely concede and agree that China controls 90% of the API supply. So there's mm. insecurity in the domestic market mm. for $22 billion. So there is an insecurity, there is a vulnerability, and we need to tackle this. The government is alive to it. It's recently, thanks to COVID, I should be saying that, but that's a fact, right? The government has come alive. They're very serious, right? From PMO, BPIO, Honorable, Captain of the Ship, uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji himself is interested in this that India should have self-sufficiency mm, and mm. so on. They have brought out a cabinet notification very recently in April, wherein three things, a huge amount of 14,000 crores has been allocated to the pharmaceutical mm, mm. industry. One is that three mega parks, pharma parks, uh, along with the state governments on a PPP basis mm. have been allocated, 3,000 crores have been given. The states have to compete amongst themselves to grab that 1,000 crores and get things moving. In these pharma parks, of the size of 1,000 to 2,000 acres as compared to 10,000 to 20,000 acres. Mm. Everything under one roof is going to be available here. You will have all the supply chain raw materials down to the last bit of excipient. That's one. Mm. Common laboratory facilities are going to be there. Common EDP effluent treatment facilities. Okay. 
everything under one roof, even transportation, inward, outward, is going to be uh, managed and facilitated in the farming part. So that's 3,000 crores. Then we have identified and hats off to the committee which has done that. 53 such molecules where we have China for, it, for imports. We don't make nothing. Everything comes in from China, right? For that, the government has made it very clear that if you set up your facility, right, whether brownfield or greenfield, greenfield. Hmm. they will give 20% incentive. And that 20% is a lot. Sure. Yeah. That's one. Third is that they will give capital subsidy at the rate of 12% spread over eight years. Hmm. So capital cost also will be recovered. Down, yeah. So these are wonderful steps. And I, I just pray and hope that we walk the talk as we go along because currently we are so seized with COVID management that it'll take a while before it unfolds and it, it gets taken forward here. Right. So with all of this that you just mentioned, these are great steps that the government has initiated. So do you think from an infrastructure perspective, government policy perspective, uh, this much would be enough to garner a larger share of the global API market? Good question. Uh, look, Rome was not built in a day. We let go the advantage that we had over China in the 80s and 90s when we were almost self-sufficient. In came China with proactive help from the Chinese government. And let me reflect on that, how they went about doing it. See, their economic model, as you are very well aware, in China, when they started you know, becoming more of capitalism, capitalism rather than communalism, was create so much of supply, the demand will automatically come. So if your you know, supply is 100, and the demand is 10, they know for the next 20 years, they've created the demand. Our economic model is very different. It, 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 unless the demand splits on it seems, we don't create supply. That's a huge difference. Same thing happened in APIs. In APIs, they said, guys, come over. I'll give you land free for the for first time for about 10 years. I'll give you water free. I'll give you electricity free. Mm. Mobilize manpower from all over the provinces and make sure that I kind of give you, uh, you know, some kind of a subsidy on manpower deployment also. What else do you want? So they got them all coming there. First 10 years, they gave everything free. Next five years, payable if able. You know, if you had the capacity to pay, otherwise you wouldn't pay. Third phase of five years, the current phase, you got to pay for everything. So they have evolved this industry in such a manner, mm. they promoted industry academia in a big way. So they stole the limelight from India and they made, economically made these scientific. And they, they almost control around 60% of the global API supply and 90% of the Indian domestic uh, global supply uh, for the formulation. So they've done a lot and we have tremendous amount of work uh, and tremendous amount of learning from there. So let me come to your question now with this backdrop. It's going to take us five years, if not mm. more, to make sure that we are 50% self-sufficient. It's going to take you another five years to be 100% self-sufficient. Mm. Mm. Take you another five years, 15 years, when you will start nibbling at the Chinese API suppliers. And then, like what you've done in formulations, the ages behind us in formulations, right? They cannot catch up with us. But we can catch up with them because we were that. Even in foundation, where all the roads lead to China, nobody in the world. I mean, the innovators are from Europe, GSK, with whom we work very close. They were the ones who started fermentation. A lot of companies in Europe, as well as in US, started fermentation. China didn't know nothing about it. By the Chinese American, they always wanted to come back because they were driven out of China way back during Mao Zedong. Correct. And they started bringing technology from the West. West. Today, they are global leaders in fermentation. Right. In fact, absolutely, you know, like fermentation based APIs is where China has a huge cost advantage as well. So, how do you think can India get into this then? I've been losing my sleep over it for the last, last three weeks or thereabouts, and I've been in touch with some of the top brains in the country and the world to see if we can do something about fermentation. My only thing where I'm deeply worried as chairman for Metzel is that, look, for fermentation products like penicillin G, mm. which is the largest blockbuster in fermentation, every country has BSM, the global behemoth. They had to go to China to create a joint venture. And today, they've sold off everything to the Chinese. In China's the only country where you get PENG and downstream derivative like six APA and seven ACA. Together, they're multiple billion dollars worth of fermentation product. Then the advantage that you have here 
is that you get maize, sorghum of a great quality, which you don't, and multiple, multiple millions of acres, right? Mm. Actively producing the kind of quality of maize that you require, then you make glucose out of it. Now, glucose and sorghum are two critical ingredients where unless you have backward integration, the ownership of cultivation of that quality of sorghum, and of course, uh, the agroclimatic conditions are excellent. Mm -hmm. Optimum temperature is about 20, 25 or thereabouts, which is absolutely great. Top it up all, uh, you know, you hardly pay anything for the utilities initially. Now, of course, you've got to pay. And manpower is easily available. Now, there are two disadvantages that China would have. One is manpower cost has gone up, utility costs have gone up, and you've got to pay for it. And those yesteryears are over. But where I'm stuck currently is the quality of captive sodium or uh, you know, mm -hmm. maize and the derived glucose out of it. Unless the likes of Reliance, and I'm sticking my neck out, Adani's, mm -hmm. all the host of all the big time entrepreneurs, all the state goes into multiple million acres of cultivation of sorghum, we would not succeed. No. Fermentation it is. In everything else, we'll succeed. No questions about it. Mm -hmm. Chemical processes, we can overtake China in about five years' time. But fermentation, unless there is a government intervention, institutional intervention, mm -hmm. Big houses intervention is going to be a tough one. Right, but do you think the industry has already started conversations with the biggies of like, uh, like the Adani's and the Reliances of the world right now? I mean, because that needs to be the first step that needs to be taken. So have conversations already started then? Reliance is already into pharmaceuticals. You know that. They have yeah. In biologicals. Biologicals. They're doing a great job. It, I've worked in Reliance for five years. Mm -hmm. This requires a knock on the door. And you can explain the prospects, the amazing prospects of overtaking China and fermentation. If Mukeshwai shows interest, mm -hmm. and if Mamji, they show interest. So it'll be my endeavor to reach out to them. Let's see what happens. Or the government, of course. Government is the biggest facilitator. Absolutely. And, and we could, we could. Uh, I mean, everybody is interested today. Mm -hmm. Never ever seen that kind of intense interest in APIs and case and key and material that I'm witnessing today. I'm sure. And with that as well, but you know, one thing what I see with the API side is that till the time APIs are available cheaper from China, there is going to be pricing pressure on the final formulation. Now, we will see this chase towards cheaper APIs continue and hence there's a possibility China could dominate. How do we break this vicious cycle? Because I do understand one point that you made that yes, the employee cost could go up with regards to China. So that's something where they could become less competitive. But how is it that we could become as competitive then? Very, very interesting question. Uh, we just had a meeting uh, in Ministry of Commerce where I report into Honorable CIM Pooj Parivu. We had a very intense meeting with the Commerce Secretary, Mr. Vadhavan. And the focus of the discussion exactly with all the Export Promotion Council, EPCs as we call them, was exactly the same. That what is it that we can do to make sure that the factory of the world does not destroy us or does not you know, stampede us post-COVID because they are ahead of us, they are recovering. The industry is at about 80% revival rate. So what came out was very clear that Government of India Ministry of Commerce is very proactive in terms of seeing the injury to the, to, to the domestic which means what? You see, it's very clear that China keeps its domestic market very attractive in pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. May it be, be APIs, may it be KSNs, right? Mm -hmm. the between the Chinese domestic market, which we've documented, and the price at which they dump into India is as much as 20 to 30 or 40%, mm -hmm. right? So, so that being the case, today I'm very, very happy and proud to inform you that we have some very, very proactive and intelligent people amongst the bureaucracy in Ministry of Commerce, who along with the department, which looks after the anti-dumping duties and safeguard duties and so on and so forth, can reach out, can figure out. And something which five years ago, I took two years to impose anti-dumping duty or a safeguard duty, today is being done in six months to eight months. Mm. So I am absolutely certain structure which has been worked out, the capital subsidy uh, which has been worked out, and the commitment on the part of Ministry of Commerce to make sure that they expeditiously handle the dumping China. I think uh, maybe we, we suffer for a little while, but mm. you should, with this kind of incentive at your back, with this kind of capital subsidy at the back, 
we'll stick it out and make sure that we put the dumping duties right up there so that we, we stop the Chinese juvenile. Right. So in the meantime, do you think there is a pressure point that would come in, especially on the pricing side then? Because if that's a pain point, one, the government has their rules as to how much can a price of a generic or any drug that could go up in, you know, I mean, in a particular year. But if that needs to be considered, what could be the pressure on the pharmaceutical companies if they have to bear the costs uh, to bear for that couple of years till we reach that point? Let me give you a backdrop uh, here, and you know that very well. See, we earlier had a regimen called Drug Price Control Order. Control, absolutely. All right. So all the life-saving drugs, so-called life-saving drugs, were under DPCO. Mm. She would always call it draconian, mm. not, but it, it was a necessity of the day mm. at that point. But then it so happened that starting off in the beginning at a reasonable level, mm. it reached a stage here where there was a huge shortage of, shortage of these drugs because it was not remunerated for the industry mm, to mm, mm. Uh, There was a huge gap between what the DPCO functionaries understood and what actually was happening in the industry. Mm -hmm. So then it was replaced by National Pharmaceutical Pricing Authority, NPPA. Mm -hmm. The basic difference between the two here is that DPCO addressed both the issues of formulation as well as API. Here, NPPA addresses the issue of only formulations and not the API. So in the, in the last one and a half to two months, there has been a sudden spur, both in the imported APIs, as well as in the domestic APIs. Mm -hmm. If you part of this role was played by the importer uh, companies, trading companies, you know, they had old stocks lying in. The moment lockdown was announced, the prices surged by 40, 50, even 100% in certain cases. So there was a big hue and cry. The Chinese ganged up recently, about 15 days ago, and increased the prices of all the APIs, key starting raw material, by as much as 20 to 30%. So both ways, the industry is being knocked, particularly in the domestic market. There's a great concern amongst all the associations such mm -hmm. as EMA, where I'm a mm -hmm. member, and also by FOPE, Federation of Pharmaceutical Enterprises, as also OPPI and a couple of others, BDMA. For them. Mm -hmm. so, so prices have gone up. It's a pain point for the domestic industry. Industry has faced huge amount of uh, supply chain disruptions, right? Mind you, in the first, uh, last week of March, the capacity utilization is not about more than 20%. Mm. In intervening next fortnight in April, it went up to about 40%, and currently it stands at about 50, weighted average, about 50 to 60%. Mm. Telangana, Andhra, they are operating at 80%. Mm. Gujarat now has taken up, and it's operating at about 60%. We in Punjab are operating at about 60, 70%. Mm. But we are operating at 20, 30%. So, because it's a pharmaceutical hub, the whole capacity utilization comes down. And besides that, overheads issue. Employees not reporting for work, furlough, paid furlough, which is wrong actually for essential industry. There's no paid furlough. So we have all these kinds of challenges besides disruptions, which have become a little pain point for the farm industry. But I'm very happy to tell you, on the exports front, after a dip of $1 billion in March, mm. which made me miss my target of $22 billion, $21 billion, brought down my growth from 12% to 8%. In April, in spite of all the problems that we've had in the sun, right? I was expecting we might miss another 500 million dollars. Now, we have overtaken last April of mm. 2019, 2.25%, which augurs very well for me going forwards in the month of May, June, thereabouts. Uh, domestic industry has slightly regrown uh, in, in April. But I think it's a matter of time once the capacity utilization goes up, which is the intention of the central government, Department of Pharmaceuticals, mm. Mr. Mm. Secretary, he's doing a great job in facilitating us. So we will level back in May and June. I think we'll register growth even in domestic. I'm sure about that. Right. But do you think there is a possibility then that overall prices would be considered, the government would look at, yes, increasing prices if there are so many issues that the industry would face? Do you think there is a representation made on that front as well? Oh, yes, to everybody. It's gone to Ministry of, of Chemicals and Fertilizers for APIs. <clears throat> and Wagelaji, as I said earlier, has promised action. Hmm. It's gone to Ministry of Commerce, it's gone to Ministry of Finance, and it's hmm. also gone to Ministry of Health, Vishwatanji. Everybody is reaching out to us to make sure that they resolve our issues. One, to make sure that API has become a part of the Essential Commodities Act, and the traders who've been holding it, who've been you know, increasing prices, they will be taken care of. That's the promise we've elicited from the government. 
this was not a part of the essential commodity. So now we have a promise from the government and commitment that they'll control it. Two is uh, efforts are effort, although there is disagreement in the industry that uh, whether API should be brought under the purview of NTPA because if it's so happens, then the API manufacturers in India will stand to suffer. So we have to do the balancing act in making sure that the industry on both sides, formulation side as well as the API side, have a balanced view and it should actually be cost-based push. If prices have to go up, whereas tomorrow in the country, mm. go up because the intermediates which come in from China have seen an increase of close to what, 20, 25%. So unless both of us sit together on both sides of the table, on a VC or whatever, not table per se, then things can be sorted out. Right, things could be sorted out from here on. Another question I want to take, especially with regards to the API side of it, is that India will have to attain self reliance, as you mentioned as well, especially in the key starting materials for API. Now, where do we stand on this journey? And secondly, if you talk about China as well, they have actually gone ahead and raised their bar, you know, for the domestic manufacturers by making a QCE testing mandatory. So, any chance we can see that also happening in India pretty soon? Uh, Hirul, uh, let me just make you understand the perspective. Uh, we, uh, you know, total size of the industry, mm, mm. Uh, the API industry in the country is about ten billion dollars, right? Six billion is for domestic, four billion is exports. Out of six billion, the domestic component is close to about three billion dollars that domestic manufacturers supply three billion dollars worth, and about three point two or thereabouts uh, is what we import. Out of that, two point eight billion dollars are imported uh, from China, which is 68% of the total imports. Now here is a situation of crux where we have to make sure that India starts treading on the path of making ourselves self-sufficient and reliant, you know, by, you know, by traversing a journey, which is a very considered phase journey. As I said, you can't wish away China, no way, but you have to live with that. Whilst you live with them, what's been happening is, and China knows it more than anybody else, they're very, very street smart and clever people, very business savvy. Uh, we export about $4 billion worth of APIs to regulated markets. Okay. Why are we able to do that in preference to China? Simple. You see, China has very insufficient capability and capacity to file drug master files and to pay for it, right? They have an issue on English language per se, but they've employed thousands and thousands of Indians to make sure that that gap is fulfilled. They are now in the process of upping their skills and capability to make mm. master files, approvable drug master files. But unfortunately, barring two, three, four top notch Chinese API companies, right? Hisum, for example, right? They're excellent, world class. Rest of them cannot face audits. So that's why, in spite of the Chinese aggression and dominance mm -hmm. of API in the world, India is still able to export $4 billion worth of APIs, primarily because of our progress in the regulated markets, not in the rest of the world markets. In certain markets, in my line of business, for example, high technology, antibiotics, called cephalosporins, I, in oral products, which is a very significant part of the business, mm -hmm. control the market completely along with two other Indian companies, right? If we can do that here, we can do it there also, provided we walk the talk exactly the way it is being spelled out in the next 15 years in our hearts. Absolutely. That's a great point that you've made as well, Dinesh. But moving on from the API segment, right now, the country is only thinking of when there will be a vaccine or when there will be a medication that will come through. Now, if I have to talk from the vaccine perspective as well, a lot of conversations that keep going around that we keep hearing of, in fact, What's the overall view that you have, you know, on whether we would be successful in developing an effective vaccine? What is the kind of timelines? Because Moderna also shared some early data on its RNA vaccine for COVID yesterday. We've been hearing of Serum Institute as well, who's been working. Uh, what is the sense that you pick up? A very contemporary question, here, And having seized of it, there's a, a PPT, which I've shared with a lot of friends in the industry as well as a couple of experts. You see, in my opinion, there are three candidates out of 70 currently, and the number is increasing by the day. You, I mean, you hear sound bites of Eastern Europe working on this, Japan working on this, mm -hmm. India, of course, is in the forefront. 
but three main candidates and now four today i expand the list to four now you see there's been such a hype about uh, moderna this morning of they're moving on to phase one to phase two right uh, hold your horses mm. uh, look at oxford medical college and the oxford mm. university mm. all the respect for dr saha sara who's uh, you know she's leading the bandwagon right from the word go my sense is if there's one vaccine which will hit the market first latest by september and i'm supremely confident about it adar uh, you know punawala punawala yeah managing director of the largest vaccine manufacturer in the world serum institute of india in pune and you've been hearing about him was just on one of the channels in india saying that he would be manufacturing 5 million doses in the next two weeks time right He's taking a risk along with Oxford, and Oxford now has joined uh, forces with AstraZeneca in Europe and Serum Institute in India. What a huge combination! You know, the largest manufacturer of vaccine in the world, the most sustained uh, research company, innovative company, AstraZeneca. So, combination. My sense is that when Oxford has gone ahead and you know started their commercial manufacturing of one million doses. and adar has gone ahead and taken this wonderful bold decision of making 5 million doses right you can imagine the sense of confidence with which they working their clinical trials in 100 patients in phase 1 has been outstanding right so my sense is that oxford would be the first one there again in defer very proud to be in it right second is uh, the the most prominent candidate again is an indian company zaidus capital health care that i worked a couple of years right they have very very good candidates which is off the docks animal testing is over i started the third one is again a very dear friend of mine dr ella dr krishna ella. and uh, that vaccine is a very different vaccine you know it's a nasal vaccine uh, bharat biotech and fusion uh, you know it follows the same course as the covid 19 virus follows it settles down in the nose and then goes down and to the lungs and destroys you this vaccine which is extremely promising the trials are going to be starting very very soon straight up our toxicity is over everything is over they are the ones who could maybe surprise the whole world by december so these are bright and of course moderna no doubt about the fact that their initial 50 odd trials are extremely good so these are four guys out of 70 who i'll put my money on in terms of the kids of the block for time straight up right so so if you could just help us understand one thing you know because what everyone talks about right now dinesh is that uh, with regards to clinical trials with regards to approvals coming in from the us fda it's a longish process now how are the i mean and usually i mean the bandwidth that they look at is at least uh, probably 100 million being tested i mean that's what the number usually that floats around now if we have to look at the phases of the vaccine development I, you know, I was reading through one of your presentations as well. You've clearly divided it into six phases: from exploratory to, you know, preclinical, moving to clinical development, regulatory reviews, manufacturing, and quality control. Now, if you have to give us a timeline that for these six steps to be followed, how long does it take? Number one, and number two, is there a way that all of these companies have fastened the process? by skipping any of it or probably taking a lower sample count is that the procedure that works right now in these kind of cases absolutely here you hit the nail on the head it takes any vaccine can take you anything minimum 18 months to about 36 months generally speaking back then we were at 18 to 36 months minimum right hmm. and that too a vaccine is a vaccine development is a very risky business you know because there are a lot of safety issues involved hmm. in biologics in vaccine so that's why you see only the top notch innovative companies going for the vaccine and they're very confident and they can afford to let go millions and millions of dollars in case it falls through right in in the safety uh, clinical trials and so on and so forth right that being the case this is a pandemic of a very high magnitude i mean not the same as spanish flu right mm-hmm. but you know 500 million people were affected and uh, 50 million people passed away right uh, i sincerely pray and hope that is not but with all the governments being seized of this pandemic so seriously all over the world starting from china down to the western nations and us in particular i mean look at the death rate over there it's mind blowing in in numbers maybe in percentile it's only about 6 7% but in numbers it's mind blowing 
and with India being right there, uh, you know, every government is now very convinced scientifically, medically, and ethically that look, if 100 patients, as in the case of Oxford, are showing very promising results, 500 patients to follow in about two months' time, right? And the company being so confident that they've gone ahead and undertaken the commercial production, risking multiple million pounds and dollars, right? Mm -hmm. They are equally intensely engaged. They've left everything behind, all the regulators, the scientific community, the medical community. They've put everything on the back burner. The only thing that they're seized of today is an effective vaccine or an effective therapy, right? So, so therefore, this is an expedited approval. Look at Rem, uh, Remdesivir. Nobody could have ever thought that it would get the emergency usage approval EUA from USFDA. They've done it because they know it has shown excellent results in some of the advanced patients, uh, you know, who are in very serious stage. And Remdesivir is excellent. Who right. could have ever this happened? Who right. could have ever thought oxychloroquine for the wrong or the right reason? I don't go to that debate, right? Would have, would have gotten that issue as well. Hmm. You know, of, of Trump approving and asking Honorable Prime Minister Modi ji to go ahead and do major shipments over there. Now, let's not go into the ethical part of it, but look at it. I mean, US FDA has given expeditious approval for anything and everything to do with COVID just to stop this menace hmm. Hmm. as soon as possible. Right. So are we trying to say that all of these companies who are already in testing phase probably have done gone through the clinical trials phase one, phase two is what they are already entering into. And between phase two and phase three, the US FDA approvals have come in quickly so that the BLA is something that they don't really have to wait for. True. Absolutely right. And rightly so. Because you see, half your job is done. Mm -hmm. if you're one and two. One and two in case of Oxford is 100 and 500. In the normal course, you would have had to do it in multiple thousand, maybe 10,000 of all communities, you know, Caucasians, Blacks, Asians, Chinese, and so on and so forth. No need to do that now. You know, and you, you, if 500 uh, patients' clinical trial is successful as per the regulatory criteria, right, then you're good to go and you can start producing. Whilst you do that, here, it is mandatory on you to ensure that you keep filing the safety toxicity data as well as the effectiveness in various communities in various countries. And that's precisely the reason that Oxford has taken a wonderful initiative of tying up with an innovator company, which has a huge reach out there in Europe, the US, and with India, uh, all over the world, developing countries in particular, uh, Africa and, and so many other countries, Latin America, Brazil, Mexico, etc. So we have that bandwidth of ROW, vast ROW population, this world population, and of course out there in the Western world. Right. I think that's something which everyone will now await as well with regards to the vaccine. But it was a great pleasure, you know, talking to you, Dinesh. Great insights, especially uh, from the API front. Secondly, a lot of information that we garnered from you as well on the process with regards to the vaccine, which with regards to the therapy, because there are so many conversations that are floating around that no one is really sure as to whether it takes 18 months and 24 months. And if it takes 18 to 24 months, how is it possible to get a vaccine by September 2020? So everything, everyone thinks that these are rumors which have really got clarified <laughs> for the you know, viewers. So I think there will be some bit of sanity amongst people as well. The anxiety is something which will be resolved also uh, with this one conversation that we've had, especially with regards to the vaccine. But thank you so much for joining us on the show. We will touch base with you once again. It's a again. pleasure. It's, it's a pleasure here as always. And, and I hope you enjoy I'm, the I'm there for anything well. that you need to know about. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Very much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you as well. Thank you.